Thank you very much for um, for inviting me um, today. I've actually changed it. I didn't realise when um, this when I was asked to speak that it was going to be a multidisciplinary audience. I should have realised that because it always should be, shouldn't it? So it's now why mental health staff should get um, involved in, in research. So I'm going to say a tiny bit about me and my experience of research, um, give you some views on research from people that I know, um, talk a little bit about how NHS staff might get involved in research using a report from the Healthcare Improvement Studies Institute, say a bit about funding um, and a bit about how you might learn to undertake research. So um, about me, I went to medical school in Southampton um, and I started my psychiatry training there. I then came to Leeds um, and, and finished it here and I've been here um, ever since. I became a consultant in old age psychiatry in Leeds since 1990. don't think there's anybody here that goes back quite that, quite that far. Um, but yeah, I've been here since 1990 and I currently work two days a week uh, in the memory service. I was the first head of the Yorkshire School of Psychiatry. I was Dean of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. That's the person responsible for, for training and setting standards um, from 2011 to 2016. I was president of the college from 2017 to 2020. Um, and I currently, as well as working two days a week clinically, I work for Health Education England two days a week. So I continue my interest in education and training. My own experience um, in research, I actually started doing research at school, amazingly. Um, I went to a school that was really, it was actually it was an all-girls school, uh, but it was really keen um, on, on research um, and on the sciences. And I did a project, Breeding Mice, to illustrate how fur co colour um, is inherited. I ended up with about uh, 200 mice. Um, some of them were at school, some of them were at home, some of them managed to escape. It was never let a lab mouse escape, but some of them managed to escape. Um, sometimes we had babies where their mother abandoned them or died and they had to come home and live in the airing cupboard. My mother was really good with that. So anyway, I, I, bred, all these, I bred all these mice um, and illustrated that fur colour is inherited in the way that we were always taught that it, it was. And then in those days, when I took my A-levels, for A-level biology, you could actually do a research component and I've always preferred that kind of thing to actually learning stuff. I'm not good at, uh, at just learning stuff off by heart. So I did the research component and I trained worms to turn. So I had worms that I caught in the garden, kept them in a tin um, of earth, which had to be kept damp. And my father made me a little sort of T-shaped plastic thing. Um, and the worm went down the T-shaped plastic thing. Um, and if it turned left, it got a small electric shock. Very, very small, very tiny. I'm sure it didn't hurt it at all. <laughs> Things, things were a bit, I don't know if I'd be allowed to do this now. Um, and if it turned right, it didn't. And the worms learnt to turn right, which was astonishing. So worms, worms can learn. As a medical student, I did a project on migraine um, in, in diabetes, looking at the prevalence of migraine in diabetes. And then as a psychiatric trainee, actually, while I was still in Southampton, I spent a year um, doing research. And then I had an academic higher training post, which included research. But um, actually, after only two years in the post, I decided I wanted to be a clinician. In those, I only did four years training, which again wouldn't be, wouldn't be allowed now. Um, but after two years, a post came up um, in Leeds. I was asked to apply for it, and I decided to become a clinician. So I left my um, academic career behind me. So with some slight regrets, I still sort of wish. I think nowadays I probably would have continued. There were no female academics at all. I'd never seen a female academic um, at that stage in my career. And it was really nice this morning to have all these women in fact, I had a horrible thought, are there any men speaking today? Because uh, I'm really careful, I will never speak at, I will never have anything to do with a conference where there are no women. And I was thinking, are we actually one without men? But no, we've had men, so that's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> have I benefited, or how have I benefited from my early research experience? I have an understanding of research methodology, and that is really important. I mean, you'll have seen the stuff um, presented this morning. We do need to understand how research has been done, doesn't it, don't we? Because we need to use it to influence our practice and not every bit of research is done to the same standards. So you need to be able to read research to understand the methodology um, and then apply it to your own, own practice. So I have an, an improved ability, and any, anybody does, um, who's done a bit of research to interpret research findings. Um, I have an interest in, in new developments and it improved my CV. There's, there's no doubt that a bit of research on your CV helps your career. So here are some other views about getting um, involved in mental health research. These are for some people that I know. Um, Graham Campbell is a psychiatrist. When I knew him, he was working down in Brighton. He's actually moved to be a full-time researcher now. And he said, it's deeply rewarding to be part of discovering new stuff. 
and he's doing a very interesting um, project looking at DMT to treat patients with major depressive um, disorder. This is a drug that's been around for a long time. It was used as a recreational psychedelic drug. Um, and he's involved in a trial where patients are given, given this. There's a few of these trials going on at the moment. You might have seen some of them. There was a TV program about it. Um, and then that's followed by psychotherapy. So there's a bit of psychotherapy um, as well. Some interesting and promising results from that, but a long way from where we can actually advise it. An academic psychiatrist, this is um, Professor Belinda Lennox, who works in, in Oxford. She says research is the only way of advancing treatments and improving outcomes for people with mental illness. And we have such a long way to go. And that's true, isn't it? We, we do have a long, a long way to go. Her research, again, very interesting. She's been looking at antibodies against MMDA receptors in people who are psychotic. Um, one of her trials, she had 228 patients who were having their first episode of psychosis, and 3% of them had antibodies compared with none of, the, um, none of the controls. Clinically, you couldn't tell the patients apart. So if you hadn't been doing this trial, you wouldn't have known that any of the patients had antibodies. And she's now running a clinical trial of immunotherapy. We're looking forward to the results of that. This is a pharmacist that I know, um, Dolly Sudd, who works in uh, Leicester. She said, having now completed a PhD, I can see a huge change in my perspective. She, she was working as a pharmacist and her, her trusts were really good. They let her do the PhD part-time while continuing working. She was the first um, pharmacist to do that in Leicester. And she says, my desire to make a difference was fueled by my clinical experience and by my un understanding of the context of working within healthcare systems. And she looked at the role of pharmacy in supporting patients with their physical health. So we know that a lot of the drugs that we use in psychiatry damage people's physical health. You know, you're more likely to get um, diabetes, you're more likely to be overweight, um, all these things that can happen. And patients aren't always properly informed about this and they aren't always given helpful tips about how to, um, how to deal with it um, and how to minimise the consequences. So, so she did a lot of work um, um, on how patients could be supported in this. This is a medical director because you can't have... Um, you can't have research in a trust without the support of the trust board and the medical director. Um, this is a medical director who says, research helps us to be innovative, stimulated, effective, and helps in recruitment and retention too. Uh, and I think that's true. People are more likely to stay in a trust um, that values them and allows them to fulfil themselves. This is an academic psychiatric trainee, somebody from Wales, Kim Kendall. Um, I don't know if any of you here use Twitter. I've been tweeting a bit this morning. Uh, if you do, follow her on Twitter because she's doing some really interesting um, research. And she described it as fun um, and asked her, her fellow um, clinical academic trainees what they thought about it. And here's a selection of their, their responses. And her research, she's been looking at people who um, carry at least one of the 12 copy number variants associated with schizophrenia. Um, so these people don't have schizophrenia, but they carry these variants and uh, they perform more poorly on cognitive um, tests. They have reduced educational occupational attainment and are more likely to be depressed. So her work is all around um, genetics and schizophrenia and very, very interesting. And finally, a patient who wanted to stay anonymous um, but said, because patients want to. Ages ago, I was part of a drug trial. I felt useful. And, and you know, other, other patients, um, when I've recruited patients into research trials, they've been, they've been really pleased to be. They, they want to help, don't they? They want to help. But do staff um, actually get involved in research? What, what makes it work and what stops it from working? So this is a report from the Healthcare Improvement Studies Institute in, in 2019 about involving NHS staff in, in, research, in research. They interviewed quite a lot of staff and they also looked at the, um, at the research. So why do people engage with research? Well, they might have a personal interest in a topic. They might believe that research and evidence can improve the quality and safety of healthcare and patient outcomes. Perhaps they've done research before um, and enjoyed it. For career development, as I mentioned, it definitely helps your, helps your CV. Um, certainly as a, as a doctor, if you've got research on, on your CV, you're more likely to develop your career. You, you might even end up on more money. I'm not sure about that, but possible. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought you might be looking. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not financial, but anyway, you're helping, you're helping people. Very important. 
that, and cultural expectations about research being part of the job. That has actually changed. So when I started, there was a real cultural expectation that all psychiatrists, um, certainly anyone working in a teaching hospital like Leeds, would be doing research. It was just expected. And that has changed, sadly, over the years. And people, I think partly because the research has got a bit more complicated um, to do, but that, that, that has changed. And there isn't quite the same cultural expectation that there was. It would be nice if we could bring that back. So what, how can staff um, engage with research? Well, lots of different ways. Um, agenda settings, so that's really important. Who decides what research that, that we do? Um, who decides where the money goes? Designing projects, you really need clinical input when you're designing a project. Recruitment of study participants. I mean, that is the really hard bit of research, is recruiting um, the study participants. And I know um, since COVID, certainly I've not been so good. I haven't been so good, have I, George? I was recruiting lots of people for you, wasn't I? I won a bottle of wine, didn't I, for recruiting the most <laughs> just before COVID. And then COVID, everything has been so difficult, hasn't it? And, and so much harder. Um, in, and I think, you know, I've, I've dropped off a bit, so I'm determined to get better, better at that. Um, because it's important, you know, you can't, you can't do the research without the study participants. They might be involved in data collection, they might be involved in data analysis. Dissemination, there's no point um, discovering new things if nobody hears about them. So it's really important that, that new work gets disseminated, that people hear about it, that people share it. Um, and, and evaluation, you know, does, does whatever's um, been suggested actually work in practice? Because obviously there's a, there's a big jump from... Um, a research environment to actually what happens in clinical practice and what's the impact well it's going to it's going to help research isn't it um, designing recruiting disseminating all the things that we've mentioned um, are going to help research actually happen um, there'll be an impact on the wider research system a attracting funding and using research and you know if uh, good quality research is done and people take notice of the results that is going to change clinical practice and it will be it will be better for patients, and people will feel more fulfilled in their careers. But there are a lot a lot of challenges. Lack of time. We're also busy, aren't we? It's really hard to find time to do these extra things. There might be a lack of support from employer um, uh, from the employer. Leeds has always been a very good um, trust for supporting research. It's, it's it's gone up and down a bit during the time I've been here. It's it's particularly good at the moment. Um, People might have a lack of knowledge and skills and, and confidence. I think people feel, sometimes people feel research is, is very hard. Um, I mean, actually, it isn't. If you've got a good supervisor who supports you in a good project, it isn't, it isn't difficult. It isn't difficult to do. And funding. Funding is the big one. Research costs money. And you've got to get the funding for it. What can actually help NHS staff to get more involved in research? Well, formal roles, having a research champion, um, clear guidelines and procedures for developing and implementing research so that if somebody sitting in a trust has an idea and thinks I'd really like to do some research into this they know how to go about it and how to get some support and access to training um, for NHS staff you do need training in research methods before you start and this is most important of all organisational leadership so it's really got to be valued by the organisation or it won't happen Funding of mental health research is a real um, problem. We invest about £115 million a year in mental health research. Um, but the UK institutions that carry out mental health research receive only about 5% of the whole budget. Investment for cancer is four times higher, um, at nearly 20%. These figures came from a few years ago, but I don't think it will have changed. And we're much less likely to receive donations from the public. So if a member of a very wealthy family dies of cancer, they're highly likely to invest a lot of money in cancer research. Um, if they die of mental health problems, then it'll probably be hushed up. I mean, that is improving. The stigma is getting less, but it's still there. We'd get nothing like um, the amount of donations that, that other parts of the system get. And if you look at the global um, funding, this was one study that looked at um, something called the Dimensions Database from 2015 to 2019, had a huge amount of data in it. Um, mental illness only got 4% of the total research investment, whereas WHO has, has calculated that it accounts for 20% of the global disease burden. So, you know, mental illness is a huge problem, um, but there still is all this stigma attached to it, and it just doesn't, doesn't get the funding um, that it needs. What can we do to improve that? Well, show, show what research can do. Keep, keep um, demonstrating that it can lead to new treatments. 
um, and show that it can reduce the impact of mental illness on, on future generations. So training to become a researcher, there's anybody here who's, who's thinking about training, there is this clinical academic training and careers um, hub. This is multidisciplinary, um, it's for everybody. Catch, there's the, um, the web address and there's lots of information about how you might become a researcher and how you might pursue a, a career in research. Don't know if there's any actually um, any actual trainees here, but this is the academic training pathway for doctors um, at the moment. When you're doing your foundation after medical school, you do two years in a foundation program, and you can do an academic foundation um, training program where you do four months academic time. You can then get an NIHR an academic clinical fel clinical fellowship, and then a quarter of your time is spent um, in academia. At that point, you do a PhD, and then you can apply for a <coughs> clinical lectureship. 50% academic time. And we were supposed to have someone from NIHR, weren't we? So I haven't said anything more about it, but I don't know, George might be able to answer any questions if there, if there are any. And just to remind you, having been the college president, about the academic faculty um, in the college, this faculty was um, established to provide a focus for people who really wanted to do academic psychiatry. It's open to all members of, of the college. They're the people behind the International Congress every year that's such a superb... Um, conference and they run prizes and awards and they're always happy to advise people. And do we have anybody from the library here? Is there anybody from the from the library? So we have we have a fantastic um, we have a fantastic library here. The building's been closed. It's been closed through the pandemic, but they're still um, working away. If you ask them for a paper, they just send it to you straight away. They'll um, do literature searches for you and they will support um, projects. And they run training. It's all done remotely at the moment on Teams or, or Zoom. There's a new catalogue out. And are these slides going to be circulated afterwards? Yes. So that, and there's the link. Lots of really interesting um, training opportunities. And that's their email if you, want to, um, if you want to contact them. So in summary, we should all be involved in research. Even if it's just reading the papers and recruiting people, we all should be involved. It increases our knowledge and understanding. It makes our work more interesting. It leads to personal satisfaction and career development. And of course, most importantly, it will improve what we can offer to our patients. So thank you for your um, attention. And there's a few minutes for questions if anybody wants to ask any.